You're listening to episode 700 of A Very Spatial Podcast, October 2nd, 2022. Hello and welcome to A Very Spatial Podcast. I'm Jesse. I'm Sue. I'm Barb. And this is Frank. And this week we're going to be talking about lots of news, but first we we took a little bit of, of a break, had a little bit of a hurricane. What you guys have going on? Um, Any flooding or anything? No, uh, it didn't, a didn't make it up to you guys, did it? Not, not yet. I mean, it's on its way now. So we're getting all the rain and stuff like that. But there actually was some unrelated little bit of flooding in parts of West Virginia, but not around here. All to to give us time to get the interview we wanted for episode 700. But hopefully that'll happen for a, an upcoming episode. Yes, because it's so, 700. Yeah. That's like a lot of numbers. <laughs> well, I was trying to contemplate that, like just in general, 700. Of, of so, the, the, the regular podcast keep in mind we have over a thousand episodes well yes of everything but like 700 and first weekly but now you know and every other week or so so that's a long time so i gave a lecture actually uh in the interim to a bunch of uh college students and there were various junior senior freshman level about podcasting and they uh uh asked how many episodes we had and well, i'm about to record our 700s and i got a lot of startled looks and it was only then that I realized, oh, that's like a really big number, apparently, because, <laughs> you know, you're just doing it all the time. And then I was in a, a meeting where I, uh, you know, I found out another group is making a, uh, a studio. And I said, well, I've got some experience in that we've, you know, got 700 episodes. And this person had a startled look. And and uh, and then I was talking to somebody socially. And I mentioned that and they had a startled look because they just started a podcast. And uh, so, yeah, I don't really realize exactly how many episodes that is. And I don't throw out the that's regular you know we have a special we have more than that yeah the 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 700 is is nice <clears throat> but there's lots of podcasts out there now that have 700 episodes because they do daily or or, or are still on weekly but whenever you tell us about the 17 year number that's when they're like what yeah, yeah. i had a, i've had more than a few go wait podcasts have around that long <laughs> yeah yeah like that's they, the, the they reaction have. they've been around that long yeah yes they have so and yeah i mean and it's been great to see all the one all the podcasts that have come along since since we got started and and uh you know kind of are having their day in the sun and stuff so um that's been cool too it's just the the waves of the medium as well while we've been doing our 17 years yeah. one of the people that we met early in the 17 years was jeff zeiss and i think he was with uh autodesk at that point whenever we did one of the AUs, uh, Autodesk Universities, which, of course, was just last week. Um, but just a sad note, is he passed away on the 14th. Oh. Um, so if you followed his his blog between the polls or had met him yeah. uh, over the years, then he'll be missed in the community. Yeah. And, and a surprising number of, of people that were in the community early on have moved into retirement even. So um, 17 years is a long time. So, moving on to the news, uh, the uh, legato will not go away. Uh, so, in April of 2020, during the end of the last administration, the FCC ruled that uh, legato, formerly Light Squared, could move forward with its um, its portion of spectrum that is very close to the GPS spectrum. But as part of this, they were uh, an external commission was required to to do a, a review and, and survey of this. And so, oh, where'd it go? Uh, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine was contracted to do an external review of the potential impact of Legato's network on GPS. And uh, GPS World has a great kind of summary of what happened along with all the responses from many, well, not all of the responses, but many responses from the relevant parties, including Legato, but more importantly, of course, to us and our side of the ideas um, from the DOD, from um, the various GPS supporting institutions. And the problem is, is that both of them are like, yay, the National Academy agreed with us. So Legato says, yes, we are not impacting um, most commercially available GPS, both terrestrial and, and aerial. Uh, and we're really only impacting those really old technology models. And so we shouldn't have to worry about those. Everybody else, including the DOD, is like, we're re using these really old expectations of technologies. And so it's going to have a huge impact on us. And so 
it's it's one of those things. It continues. Um, it's now, I think, back to the FCC. Uh, it's a very different FCC now than it was two years ago or a little over two years ago. Um, so I'm curious to see uh, how this will move forward. Of course, this report just came out two weeks ago uh, or so. And so it's it's a question of what the timeline we're looking at in terms of some sort of either go ahead or or stop motion um, in this. Yeah, and it's going to be precedent setting ultimately for these things in the future. So some, I think something has to be has to come down as a final. Well, but it had, and well, then the yeah, the, but it FCC did. in twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But that's just well, it. With you know, every every administration, it can change. Yeah. So. Well, well, the really frustrating thing here is, of course, is ultimately we're talking about physics, which doesn't change. You know, it, is that we've got spectrums; they're very set, and they just are what they are. And this is a political process, and by definition, all political processes are fluid. You know, the decisions can change because you know, well, things have changed in technology, which we expect to evolve quickly and constantly. But it's, since it's tied to physics, it's like, well, yeah, but no. <laughs> so it's kind of it's if you get your if you get your sensors and your broadcast spectrum more finely tuned, then yeah, that technology can evolve so this is possible. So there's a more of a hard line between X and Y. So it is better, but it's still it's a very complicated thing. Yeah, and that's what the National Academy said, right? Is that this is there is going to be impacts to existing technologies, but technologies can be created and there's technology for this to move forward uh, as it is. And so that's where the the either or comes in. It's like, okay, well, do the people who have these technologies already, GPS receivers that are high accuracy just receivers that are the ones that are gonna be impacted, do they have to go out and buy all new technologies so that Legato can move forward or should they because you know those are older technologies and aren't really as potentially accurate as they could be but it, and, and, and of course it gets to the whole issue of uh accuracy being for purpose like even though they're not as accurate as they could be are they accurate enough for what they need and therefore you know do we have a a, a mandate to say yeah but you could get better so go get better you know which is essentially just sort of sort of rewording what you just said so it, it is it, it is a uh, an important precedent to say, well, if you can get better, you have an obligation to get better, which is a little nuts. But there's also the question of, you know, who does who should the cost come down to? The someone who is new, who doesn't have this rolled out yet, or the people who already have these things who have already spent the money. So it's uh, you know, it's a long term, unfortunately, question that continues to go and, on. And, and, and in this case, it's even more complicated because the federal government's going, yeah, but we already kind of sold them the space. <laughs> so it's like. <laughs> and that's what I thought was interesting in the report was saying that, you know, there this is a living asset. And it's something that you hear more in other areas with the spectrum and with satellites, which is about real estate and the threshold of real estate. And, you know, that this is a very real space with, like you said, implications of who's going to change and how are they going to change, uh, but who's going to make that deciding factor. But as more people get into things, it's going to become a very real pressing question um, of the policy versus that real life physical space can only handle so much that's going on. So India is trying to push cell phone carriers to begin using their newer GNSS system, NAVIC, which I just forgot what, what NAVIC stands for. Does anybody remember? I can't remember. Uh, Navi navigation. navigation with Indian Constellation. Yeah, so it's... It's very clear. Sure. Um, it utilizes uh, three geostationary satellites. It has another four geosynchronous satellites, and then it has two that are ready to go up if something happens to any of those. And so it's a... It, it's very specific to that area, so it's going to only be useful in South Asia. And so, yeah, I mean, they're they're kind of pushing for carriers, for phone manufacturers. Um, and, of course, Qualcomm, who provides a lot of the existing chips for um, Android phones, are rolling this in. So it's kind of a push on Apple, I think. Um, and others who aren't using Snapdragon chips 
to try to incorporate into their systems. It's kind of curious. Well, I think that we're going to, you know, this is this is the next stage in what we've seen, right? Because as is pointed out many, many times, right, the existing systems are reliant on, well, GPS is reliant on the U.S. government because mm-hmm. it's government owned. And um, GLONASS Russian, uh, European Space Agency, Galileo. And so others look into that space and say, well, first of all, potentially we could have better accuracy if we have satellites that are focused on our region. But second of all, right, that's, it becomes a broader question of what happens if others decide to turn things off, if they don't maintain them. And so with the bigger reliance, greater, much greater reliance on location technologies through smartphones. Um, but that's a question too, again, to, because it's it's kind of this this push pull if you want to sell them and use them in our space <laughs> literally our space on our physical space on the ground right it has to have this technology uh, and so you know there's always been kind of a little bit of that uh, going on with some of these and it comes back with the frequency right that they're currently using l5 for satellite communication and uh, that's not what most phones are using the most phones are using l1 yeah and one of the things that uh I just gave my GNS lecture uh, last week, and one of the things that we have on there, you know, is how to make your your data more accurate, uh, your your uh, GPS signal for the most part you know, in the United States. And one of the things they say is, you know, use uh, GLONASS as a check. And I'm like, well, that's obviously a bit more problematic than it was, say, three years ago, <laughs> you know, in, given world politics. So you can sort of understand how. Like you're saying, Sue, some of these uh, geopolitical things will push certain things, but there's also, you know, adding in another spectrum and, and another sensor, just it's more money. And uh, there's not a lot of room left in an iPhone, really, when you get down to it. So, Well, I mean, there's more and more chipsets that support multiple devices. So um, I think if the current U.S. iPhone doesn't do it, there's other regional iPhones that, you know, support Beidou, um, QZSS. Uh, GLONASS and GPS, of course, as we've talked about in the past, um, Galileo. So um, we're really looking at more of these being supported. And again, it's a lot of it's tied to which frequency is coming in. As long as you have a receiver, then you should be able to switch between the um, streams that you're you're gathering. And, you know, it's it's just one of those things that whether you're talking about something in your pocket or a high accuracy unit from Juniper or Tremble or somebody like that, you have more devices that support multiple feeds. And so you can do that cross-checking now. But, I mean, to be fair, and I think I think some of the articles are noting this too, right? Those systems have been around longer, more time for testing, you know, more time to, to get them implemented. And yeah, India yeah. is kind of, but India is... Do it now. Yeah, and also known for um, using a, a bit of pressure, uh, financial pressure and stuff where they can. Uh, well, that, for that's what this is to do to, <laughs> to do things that they they approve of. So, fun side note: I did discover this week uh, the proper pronunciation is Beido. Um, and the, I asked uh, uh, my colleague; he's born and raised in China, and he now works in, in West Virginia. I said, "How do I say this?" Because <laughs> I never can figure out how to say this. And the only way I can remember to, how to say it is sitting on the dock of the bay, do re mi so you know, do. So there's a fun little mnemonic for you guys out there. Yeah. Um, moving on to some Google map news, a couple of cool things that they've implemented uh, that are, I think, acknowledging some of the changes in technology. The first is, is that now in Google maps, you can pick the most efficient routes for EVs as we should be all aware is that uh, EV range and, and that sort of thing is a bit of an anxiety around that is a bit of an issue within the market. Uh, you don't, you can't just stop any old gas station and fill up and move on to the next thing, unlike gas. So you've got to sort of have some idea where the charging stations are located at and when you're likely to run out of electricity or get a little bit of more of a challenge uh, in being able to, to charge your vehicle. So Google Maps and I'll help you solve that problem and say, great, if you're going from point A to point B, these are the routes that you should pick so you have the better chance of being able to charge your vehicle. Um, and I think that's going to be probably added into lots of different Apple Maps and every other mapping application increasingly as we evolve towards EVs in the United States. I think this is going to be really critical in rural areas. So I haven't looked at the data to see how diverse the data sets are. 
uh, or if they're just really focused on interstates and, and major urban areas or something like that. But out West, I can see where uh, EV range is going to be much more of a, uh, and the anxiety around it is going to be much more of an issue. Well, and even if it doesn't have the um, the EV charging stations themselves, which it, it probably does, because of course, a lot of those, uh, the, you know, everything from Electrify America to Tesla want those on maps. But really, it's also about, you know, efficiency. So, you know, if you can take this route that avoids going straight up a mountainside versus one that just takes a little bit longer in terms of time, but doesn't use as much battery, I think that's really as, as important as knowing where these things are. And, you know, in urban areas, it doesn't really matter because there's charging stations enough, but you're right. It's those rural areas where you're making those longer trips and that's where the range anxiety comes in. It's where, you know, the thing that is keeping a lot of people from buying just a straight, electric vehicle. And we do see more people, I think, beginning to adopt at least hybrid or um, plug-in hybrids. But yeah, outside of people living in urban areas, the I think the adoption rate of, of straight EVs is, is still probably pretty low because of that range anxiety. Yeah. I'm kind of curious how in-depth the algorithm goes. For example, does it take into account uh, air temperature, because uh, obviously if it's colder, your battery lasts longer than if it's warmer, you know, all sorts of questions like that. Like you said, elevation. And I'm wondering how this interacts with the algorithm. If you've ever used Google Maps, particularly in uh, really urban areas, it takes you through some weird places, man, under the general guise of, I guess, I don't, I've never really understood if it's saving a few hundred feet or saving a couple of seconds, but <laughs> you go through some weird neighborhoods. That in Pittsburgh in particular, we go through some weird places. I'm like, you know, this would have been easier if you just said, go to here, take a left, go to the end of that road, and that's where you'll end up. <laughs> yeah, I think that some of them, are, I mean, I've noticed, because I don't really use it that often, but a trip that we just took had the, this is most fuel efficient. And you're like, wait a minute, if you literally had just turned like two turns before. Um, but I think I, I was thinking that too about the the algorithm, and I'm wondering what potential feedback there's going to be to improve that, because I still think that this would be, um, you know, as when other features have been um, rolled out that its predictions may or may not, you know, be reasonably accurate to rely on as an EV <laughs> user. And especially when you're kind of going out in areas that are um, few and far between for charging, that there would be, I would think some additional data hopefully coming in or uh, used to refine it before it would be maybe super dependable. Yeah, I was going to raise that issue. Is that I'm wondering if it'll know what kind of vehicle you have. You know, if you're in a, a Ford F-150 Lightning, it's a different situation than you're in a Model Three from Tesla. Yeah. So moving beyond that, uh, other additions to Google Maps that they've uh, rolled out is augmented search results, which is kind of one of those things that, to my mind, I guess it's because we've been talking about augmented reality since I don't know, ten years, something like that. We've been talking about on this podcast, maybe longer. It was a little bit of a shock to see this as a news item that it kind of doesn't exist already. Um, but the idea is, is that, you know, you can bring up Google Maps on your phone and you can show the augmented, uh, you know, view of whatever you're looking at if you want. They've had, they've had that for a few years now. Now they're going to actually have the little push pins that show up that say, oh, by the way, this is the coffee shop and they close in 20 minutes and this is the jeans you like on sale and that sort of thing. It's not as cool as uh, that Tom Cruise movie, but you know, it is very much sort of in that vein of adding those sort of search results in, uh, particularly if you're looking for something specific, I'm looking for somewhere to eat. Okay. Here are the point push points for the augmented reality to show you that. I don't know if you re- remember this, maybe it's because I just recently watched it, but one of the earlier geospatial revolution videos does have it that way. So I guess in my mind, you just perceive it as, Oh, this is, we've had this. Well, no, we haven't. That was just our, visual way of showing how it works it's not actually how it worked till now so it's just actually we had it and yeah. it was about the same time that that geospatial revolution came in so yelp had monocle and then like city three lens. years Remember ago city lens? and before that was city Windows lens from Microsoft. Or nokia that had that yeah yeah it was kind of cool um yeah. and you know all these things existed but they didn't maintain because people weren't thinking augmented reality and even in yelp monocle was you had to like hunt for how to turn it on. Then you had to rotate the, remember to rotate the phone to get the monocle view to come up. 
And so I, I've had a hard time talking about geospatial and, and augmented reality in the last three years because the easiest tools had disappeared. So this is nice for class. Yeah. It, it is, so but again, it's it's news, but you're like, wait, that's news? <laughs> it's, it's news that already Google in? is making it more embedded. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, I mean, you just know Apple Maps and everybody else is going to embed this more so in the coming you know, months and and in a couple of years, because they just sort of all sort of seem to go in the same broadly working together, even inadvertently. Um, so it hopefully it'll become more useful for people. And become more ubiquitous. Widely, yeah, ubiquitous. And especially as we're hopefully, fingers crossed, moving into the augmented reality glasses phase part, whatever we're moving into. Um, That'll, that'll Precursor phase 12. Yes, phase whatever. <laughs> but they've almost got me convinced on this one because I have the my Echo frames and I like them for, for stuff. So I might wear glasses that are augmented. I may, I may be a convert for uh, because I've been eased into it with this. Well, and, you know, we've used I, the HoloLens quite a bit. We, you know, yeah. we've used VR as well. But, you know, having access to the HoloLens, having access to, um, well, at least seeing news items about um, Lenovo's new headsets and the fact that more pass through was coming to things like the HTC Frank was just talking about uh, before the podcast uh, and you know even the Quest now is doing uh, pass through better. So yeah, I think I, I'm hoping that we'll see more adoption. Um, and I, I know the companies that are making these things hope that yes. too. But here's the feature or not feature of VR that I don't think can be solved with any type of technology I can think about. But if any of the manufacturers, the hardware manufacturers, could solve the, my head sweats like I'm in a sauna, I will buy their device. I don't care what it costs. If they could solve that problem. <laughs> because that, li sorry, it's it's a weird aside, but it's like, it's kind of crucial. Well, you know, related to that, the other day I came downstairs and Barbara said, you've got a red thing around your face. And I was like, oh, I had the VR on it. Yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah it's it was, like those things. But it's it's weird. Like it's a weird spot to sweat. But it's like once you feel it, it's super, super. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. If you want to know like what really users do, wait and see what the third party accessories are that come out for devices. And then you'll tell. These are the things that users have figured out about your device. But but that's one that where augmented reality and glasses that are open, if they could just make it work. And have that, you know, still maybe even have a VR experience with something more open. I, I, I just, whatever money I would have to put toward it, I would. <laughs> I'm not on board with the with the contacts, though. Even though yeah, they're working uh, yeah, on those, okay. I'm, so I'm not on maybe board. Not that. But anyway, oh no, I don't like to poke them in my eye with a finger. I was, I, I once looked into the contacts and I could just put the thing in your eye, and I was like, no, no. <laughs> just, no, I don't need no. to. There are these things called glasses that work just fine. Thank you. Yeah, I don't need to poke myself in the eye every morning. I'm passing. No offense to you, contact affection honors. Not related to augmented reality. Is um, there has been uh, some research, some new research that came out and was published in the geophysical research letters, um, and I like this because it they took a global scale view of climate change, looking at lakes worldwide, and they were using five point. 14 million satellite images for over 85,000 lakes. And they found that blue lakes worldwide are risking um, turning green brown. And it's the first global inventory of lake color. Um, and I just think it's really fascinating that you think something like this, again, that something like this was being done, but it hasn't been done before. So they're saying, yes, the color of lakes can change seasonally, um, but this is due to other factors. They're looking at things like algae and stuff like that when you're talking about warming um, and if warming persists. So it's just really fascinating and it shows the different degrees of warming could affect water color um, and looking into what that means. I agree. I mean, that when I saw this, I couldn't believe that it didn't, didn't exist. And, and there may be some aspects of it uh, that are referenced in the study, but also that there was no link that I could click on to see it. Like there's no online lake color inventory because it's another one of those really good examples that until you actually you know work on it or see or see another researcher do it it's really amazing the things that remotely sensed data can tell us if we just think about you know if we frame questions and um the idea of of lake color i mean lake color is really important to understanding the what's going on in the lake um 
it's it's health health in quotes is kind of one term but also um where the lake is what kind of um you know what kind of bottom is in the lake so whether it's you know stony or types of things there's all kinds of things that play into it temperature time of year and just never really thought about it and then to see kind of a, a global sale use of remote sensing that way uh, which is kind of cool to me i think it's really funny to think some researchers went okay lakes are green and somebody went okay but are they and then like in my head they're sitting around the lunch room going well yeah okay but are they well, of course they're green well, how do we know they're green well, that's a really good question how do we know we're green <laughs> that's like what it's like this is the start of that conversation <laughs> and What's interesting to me is I went to an AAG presentation at last year's AAG where someone was discussing the impact of things like this, which was they were doing planning and they were in an area around a lake and around 68% of lakes are lakes that would be um, impacted by something like this, green, brown lakes, um, all which are 69% of all lakes, that somebody that wanted to build houses around a lake were upset that the lake wasn't as pretty as they wanted it to be. And they thought there was a way for them to fix it. And again, it had to do with the lake shape. It had to do with the depth, precipitation. And so you're right. This a visual would be a good way to educate people about the impacts of, you know, everything on lakes, but also that, you know, why lakes are the way they are, which for some reason we haven't gotten our mind around. Next up in the news, although it's a little bit late, the census 2020 uh, center of population has been announced. So for those of you not familiar, uh, whenever we do a, a census in the United States, uh, we actually calculate, or we, not we, the Census Bureau, <laughs> actually calculates the center of population. And it's an interesting, uh, it's a single point, but it's an interesting way, especially over time, to see how migration and all kinds of processes have affected where people live in the United States. And so 2020 center of population is Hartville, Missouri, in the Ozark Mountains. So that spot will get a permanent marker. Uh, and and there's actually also commemorative markers as well of this. And there'll be a celebration related to that. But um, it's a little bit late because there were some extensions of the 2020 census uh, due to, to uh, the COVID pandemic. And so uh, it's really interesting that uh, for the last few censuses, the center population has been in Missouri, uh, but it's actually been shifting uh, in that state. So um, if you want to see where it is, check out Hartville, Missouri and your, your uh, online mapping of choice. Uh, and We'll see what happens in another 10 years. And then we'll start looking at those trends again and go, hmm, what's kind of playing into th this shift? I, I think you can Google around. There's uh, a couple animations that show you the center of the population changing from uh, maybe as far back as the 18th century uh, through you know, 2010, at least. I'm assuming they'll have this new data point in. And it's kind of interesting to watch that, that, that aggregate number. It doesn't seem like much of anything, but it does give you an idea of how we've uh, migrated as a, as a people in the United States. And, and I think it's sort of rolls into the general philosophy of ESDA. Start with really simple things to kind of get an idea of what's going on and the trend wise, and that can tell you a lot to start generating more questions. And that's just an example, you know, a minor one, but an important one. What I find amusing is that it's a uh, population um, the center population is a point where an Im imaginary flat weight list and rigid map of the United States would balance perfectly if everyone were of identical weight. And it's based off of physically manually doing that um, when this first started being calculated. Um, and it's fun to look up and see um, that balance, that rigid paper cardboard balancing on the point. Moving back to some space news, Planet Labs is getting ready to launch their next uh, kind of initiative, and they're working with different groups, including the Carbon Mapper Coalition, um, to focus on hyperspectral. And, you know, we don't talk about hyperspectral a lot, but hyperspectral is just awesome, I think is the yes. simplest way of putting it. Um, you know, we're used to three band we're kind of used to four band we like multi-spectral from things like landsat and, and um why can i never remember europe's sentinel copernicus copernicus well yeah sentinels within the copernicus yes copernicus. uh copernicus copernicus uh, copernicus, <laughs> copernicus. What is happening? copernicus uh <laughs> group and, and others of course uh india has a great set of satellites uh, and multi-spectral same with china uh and others but just 
so few true hyperspectral satellites. And so uh, these first two, which should be launched in 2023, are looking at over 400 spectral bands. So just imagine, you know, we're not talking about like a full getting out to microwave lengths or anything like that. We're talking, you know, still fairly close within the, the same area that a lot of these other satellites, multispectral satellites, cover with 15, 16 bands. They're going to cover such small sections of it that it's going to be 400 spectral bands in the same sets of wavelengths. Just awesome. Well, and I'm thinking too at 30 meters, right, at the resolution of Landsat bands, um, that's going to be really interesting. And it's going to be a massive amount of uh, data because a lot of the early hyperspectral uh, instruments were actually pretty coarse resolution in comparison. I mean, 30 is coarse, but, you know, whenever we're talking about well, for uh, Modis and stuff. things like that, you know, yeah. you're, you were talking about, well, actually some of them did get down to 30, didn't they? Yeah, a few, but there were yeah. some of the other ones, like I think ours was, was uh, bigger pixels. But. Yeah, but still. But I noticed you're not mentioning the, the name of it, which I think is cool that I could ever say, right? There's the, uh, the is it Tanager or Taniger? But it's a, a big group of birds that are actually really pretty. And I remember from the Audubon books, but I don't know if you say it, Tanager or Taniger. I, I like how they chose totally different, but that's kind I of. I like cool how name. they chose the name to highlight that it's a um, species threatened with endangerment, um, and that they chose it because they're hoping that decision makers will use all the data they're producing um, for the betterment of the Earth. A nice reminder and a pretty bird. Yeah, there's there's so many of them. I can remember uh, just a couple of them that I always was, was impressed with the blue ones. But um, but the other thing that, that's of note is I'm really interested to see the form factor of these hyperspectral satellites because, of course, planet's known for its dove uh, constellations, right, the, the smaller satellites. And so I'm curious what kind of sensor they're making that will that will do this. I'm looking at the pronunciation guide for it, and that doesn't actually help me. I think it's Tanager. But... Yeah, I think it's Tanager. But I want to, you know, I want so to throw you, it out there that... you think the AE um, is Tanager? I, I don't think I've ever said it out loud, but um, I've always been, like I say, impressed with the blue ones because the, the color of blue that the blue, the blue species of tanagers are really pretty. So. Yes, it is. It is the tanager based on yeah. the pronunciation guide. And of course, not just dove, but the um, much higher resolution pelicans as yes. well. So. Well, will be called pelican was originally, whenever it first was launched with Skysat. But that's that. I, I think we can remember back to our discussion of the creepiness of that name. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I believe Frank kicked <laughs> that one off. Yes. So anyway, but I, I am actually really gonna be interested to see how that, that mission plays out and when they launch. So And then finally, just to come back to where we started off with GNSS, Galileo satellites twenty seven and twenty eight have been launched. Oh wow. So we are getting closer to uh, the full constellation finally, um, you know, despite all the issues at the beginning with uh, funds and then, of course, Brexit, uh, we're, we're getting to the point where Galileo's not just usable, which, is, you know, it's been usable like we talked about earlier. Um, it's being used in cell phones and things like that, but it's it's going to be complete and, you know, fully operational. And that's just and then they'll awesome. have to start looking at re the replacements to cycle out the old one yeah. <laughs> it's, it's never ending which again is is why there's a lot of questions over you, the users everywhere of these satellite systems is that it isn't just get them up there one and done it's you have to maintain the program so so they're up they're running they've been tested and they're operational um, after being launched at the end of last year now everything is set good to go and uh, should have even faster fixes to locations now if you're using uh, Galileo for your GNSS system or GNSS purposes. There we go. That's what I was looking for, purposes. Yeah. Anything else? Can I throw in another news item? Sure. All right. So the FCC has released a new set of guidelines on how you deorbit uh, the rules and guidelines for deorbiting satellites. And uh, this was you know, uh, unanimously approved by the FCC. The, their basic idea is if you have a low Earth orbit satellite and it, you turn it off, you got five years to clean up your garbage. That's basically the short of it. Um, the tricky bit here is that uh, there's a couple problems. 
first of all, this does not comply properly with the um, NASA's rules and some of the international guidelines that NASA has worked out with other space agencies. Of course, NASA's rules were made in 1990, so they're quite old and they need to be, I think it was in the 90s, I think it was 1990, um, and they, they need to be upgraded or updated given the sheer volume of satellites we got flying around in the, uh, around the planet. Uh, so this is something that needs to be picked up. And the other complication is that there are members of Congress that say, hey, I don't actually think FCC has any juris justification or jurisdiction, jurisdiction. Oh, words are hard. Uh, in this particular area uh, to come up with these rules. But I think it's important that we are continuing the conversation about, we got a lot of stuff up there. Maybe we ought to clean it out a little bit. And then on top of those other two that Frank pointed out, or three, um, apparently Space Force may have to get involved in that as well because NASA had to get approval from Space Force to launch uh, for the launch window that then of course got closed by the, the hurricane, but so apparently NASA isn't the go-to for space stuff anymore. Yeah. I and mean, so it's, it's, it, it's a very changing uh, regulatory infrastructure here in the United States. And of course that brings in, cause a bunch of stuff we talked about today was, you know, India. Uh, and of course we talked about Galileo, we talked about GLONASS, we talked about, you know, all these other agencies. They're the United States, is not the only people are shooting stuff in the, in the orbit. So, well, and this is the thing, right, that, that's been made apparent in the last few years is that these things worked because there wasn't, a, there weren't a lot necessarily of satellites early on. Everybody worked together and it was a small community and now that's not the case anymore, right? And so um, I think that you're seeing frustration over, you know, maybe things not happening behind the scenes or, you know in the old methods trying to push something which i don't think uh in principle is a bad thing at all and and it will only affect in theory if if this kind of rule actually does get used it will affect satellites that go up after this so it's not even affecting things that are that are already in orbit but i mean i think it's a recognition that you know, people are like we got to do something about this yeah. and yeah, trying I, to push it and then others saying wait a minute you can't do that and so I heard someone from NASA recently used for this problem the the term threshold, that there's literally a physical threshold for how much can be up there and everything work. Um, so there it is a discussion that needs to be had, you know, no matter where it comes out of. Um, we don't have unlimited real estate, you know, another term we're seeing used a lot more, but there's only so much space and space to that's usable. And in a final, final note. A NASA note, not really necessarily geography per se, but planet planetary defense, I think, is that uh, um, since our last podcast, there was a successful mission called DART to actually uh, crash a satellite into an asteroid to shift its path. And we'll find out in a few months whether or not it worked. Well, uh, in well my head, the preliminary were... is that it, that it did. It hit. It we hit. don't well, know if it moved. That was the thing they were trying to test, can it? But yes, as to the second part of it, not yet, but but anyway. So. Yeah. So the, the thing about darts that I don't think people are getting uh, is that this is like throwing literally a dart hitting a baseball yeah. on the other side of a town. Yeah. I mean, it's like, While the base after the baseball had been thrown. Yes. Right. After the baseball had been thrown and it's still in the air and then you're throwing a dart to hit it on the other side of town. I mean, hitting it is pretty freaking amazing yeah. in its own right. I mean, it, it that's that's a feat. Yes. It hitting it hard enough to knock it off course nice bonus yeah what we're concerned if we can do that's like stage really, two because yeah, you get to figure out hitting, how big a satellite you need and all that kind of stuff yeah but 10 years of development is what yeah. it took to get there clearly a whole generation affected by armageddon and what was the other one <laughs> that deep dealt impact. with the asteroids deep impact yeah deep impact there you go yeah so that was about 10 again years. i like to think that they're in the in the in the lunchroom going well would that work <laughs> could we get <laughs> hard enough <laughs> I don't know. Let's find out. So, turns out the chances are not zero. <laughs> yeah. This week in the events corner, the Any Eurissa Day is a conference hosted by New England Eurissa. Makes sense, right? Uh, it'll be held virtually October 24th and 25th, and the theme is going to be creating community connections. You can find out more, of course, by following the link in the show notes. Of course, if you'd like us to add your event to the podcast, send us an email to podcast at veryspatial.com. If you'd like to reach us individually, I can be reached at sue at 
I can be reached at Barb at VerySpatial.com. And you can reach me at Frank at VerySpatial.com or any of the social medias at NojoBar. I'm available at Kind of Spatial. And of course, if you'd like to find all of our contact information, head over to VerySpatial.com slash contact. As always, we're the folks from Very Spatial. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks.